Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the 2019 David H. Miller Lecture. My name is Ambassador Ruben Brigitte. I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs here at the George Washington University. In just a moment, you will hear from our guest of honor, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Ambassador Tibor Naj, who also happens to be an alumnus of the George Washington University School of Business, where he earned a Master of Science. But first, I would like to acknowledge many of David's family members and longtime friends who are here with us tonight, in particular his widow, Kyung Cho Miller, and I also understand, because I met them just briefly earlier, David's mother, uh, Mrs. Miller, is also here, as well as his sister and his brother-in-law. To all the family members, you're most welcome. We're delighted to have you here with us. Some of you in the audience know the history of the special, of the special lecture series at GW and the Elliott School. For those of you who do not know, let me briefly share, briefly share it with you. David Miller graduated with a political science degree from George Washington University's Columbian College in 1987, and he dedicated his professional life to advancing U.S.-African relations. During his career, Mr. Miller served as a desk officer for South Africa, Angola, and Namibia at the U.S. Agency for International Development, and he also served as a managing partner for Africa Global. In 1993, Mr. Miller was named the first executive director of the Corporate Council in Africa, which is a membership organization that promotes business and investment between the United States and the nations of Africa. I did not have the privilege of meeting Mr. Miller, but from what I can tell, and from everyone I know who did know him, he was a man ahead of his time as far as his interest in and devotion to this part of the world were concerned. Plus, he also was just an incredibly decent human being. Cancer took David's life far too early, in 2004, when he was just 39 years old. Later that year, numerous GW classmates and family members came together to create the David H. Miller Foundation and to raise the funds to establish the David H. Miller Memorial Endowment for African Studies at GW and the Elliott School. Funds from the Miller Endowment have been integral to this lecture series the first of which featured former President of the Republic of Mozambique, Joaquin Chisano, in 2008. Other David H. Miller lecture speakers since have included Dr. Carlos Lopez, Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, Mimi Alamayo, former Executive Vice President of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and William, Be uh, William Bellamy, former U.S. Ambassador to Kenya. In addition, the endowment makes possible key academic exchanges. Over the past decade, numerous master's degree students from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa have studied at the Elliott School for a semester. In fact, with us tonight is Ms. Topongo Kapane, a WITS graduate student who received a 2019 fellowship thanks to the Miller Endowment. Is Topongo here? Yes, raise your hand, stand up so everybody can see you. <laughs> She is what we might call part of the living and ongoing legacy of David Miller. Her master's thesis is focused on e-governance and transparency in South Africa. She recently shared what this opportunity meant to her. Quote, I owe this time at GW to the generous donors who made it possible for me to dream bigger beyond what I already knew as the highest limit I could reach in my life. End quote. For 15 years, the Miller Endowment has played a critical role in ensuring greater attention to Africa and to U.S.-Africa relations on GW's campus. In 2016, the Elliott School chartered the Institute for African Studies, which is the sponsor for tonight's program. The Institute creates a tangible hub to build on the university's previous efforts focused on Africa, including those connected with and supported by the Miller Endowment. The director of the Institute, as of last July, is Professor Jennifer Cook. Please welcome Professor Cook to the podium, who will then introduce our guest speaker, Assistant Secretary T. Bordage. Jennifer, give the floor. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm so glad to see you, and I just want to echo uh, Dean Brigany's uh, uh, thanks to the Miller family um, 
uh, for and the friends and family for allowing us to honor David Miller's legacy uh, through this endowment and exchanges uh, that I hope will continue to kind of highlight his very fundamentally optimistic, forward-looking engagement on Africa. So I, I do hope that we continue to honor that, and we're very happy to, to, um, to be able to do that. I do hope also you'll get an opportunity to meet Tabogo. Um, she is just an absolute delight, uh, and her energy, her enthusiasm, uh, and determination to make the most of this opportunity uh, are really infectious. Um, she's a terrific ambassador for Wits University and for South Africa, and she's a testament um, to the value, I think, of educational exchange. So, Tabogo, thank you so much for coming. I'm delighted this evening, this is far away, and I'm realizing I start to need glasses at this point. I'm delighted uh, tonight to welcome our sp special guest, Ambassador Tibor Naj, who took up his position as Assistant Secretary for African Affairs in July 2018. Ambassador Naj was born in Hungary. His family fled the country in the mid-1950s as the Soviet Union moved in to crush the Hungarian Revolution, and his father, who was a military officer at the time, became a potential target. His family was processed for resettlement in the United States at the U.S. Embassy in Vienna. And Ambassador Naj has said uh, that it was the warmth and kindness that the embassy personnel showed to him and his refugee family that made him decide that if he ever got to the United States, he was gonna become a, an American diplomat. So, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Nash has spent more than 30 years as a career foreign service officer, including 20 years in assignments across Africa. He served as US ambassador in Ethiopia, Guinea, DCM in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Togo, previous posts in uh, Zambia, Seychelles, and Ethiopia, I definitely think you qualify as an Africa hand. Let me just say that. I also want to say a warm thanks and a warm welcome uh, to his wife, Mrs. Jane Naj. As a child of Foreign Service parents, I know that Foreign Service families share in the excitement and joy of the Foreign Service, uh, but there are many challenges in that constant uprooting and replanting. Um, and it, that may be very rewarding in the end, but it's uh, not always easy. Um, so it's a real partnership, and uh, we're very glad that you're here tonight. After retiring from the Foreign Service, Ambassador Naj serves as Vice Provost for International Affairs at Te Texas Tech University, lecturing and writing on Africa, foreign policy, international development, U.S. diplomacy, and was enticed back to Washington last year uh, to lead U.S. policy at the State Department, tasked with implementing the Trump administration's new Africa policy strategy rolled out by Ambassador John Bolton uh, in December. Uh, so tonight, I think we're very keen to hear from you what you see as the big areas of change and the shifts of focus and emphasis within the strategy, as well, I think, as the areas of continuity, um, you know, perhaps looking back over the long arc of your career of engagement in Africa. So Ambassador Naj will give some opening framing remarks We'll sit down uh, for a few uh, questions and conversations, and then open up to Q&A. So welcome, and uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Chico Naj. Good afternoon, and I promise to make my remarks very brief, because I know you guys come out here for the exchange, not to listen to you know, the fount of wisdom that I'm going to throw at you guys. Um, Coming back to Africa has been really, really interesting. Um, so many changes and so many things which, unfortunately, have stayed the same. When uh, Jane and I first went to Africa, 1978, Zambia, there were exactly seven international lines outside of the country to call the United States. We had to book a call weeks in advance. And then when we did finally get a call, we had to make sure that we said some interesting things during the conversation so that the Zambians who were listening on the line would keep the line open and not switch it to somebody else. Um, today, on the other hand, my gosh, uh, everybody in Africa has a cell phone, even in the rural areas. Uh, they do their banking with their cell phones. They can check the prices of the day for goats to sell, and they can even send money home to their families. As I said, other things 
have unfortunately not changed. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Cameroon, had a uh, conversation with President Bia. We could have had the same conversation 30 some years ago when I served as charge in DCM in Cameroon. The subject didn't change, and of course, the head of state hasn't changed. There were also some constants during much of my career in Africa. During most of it, uh, Africa unfortunately served more or less as uh, one of the chess pieces on the chessboard between the United States and the uh, Soviet Union. Africa's welfare was very much secondary to that competition. Also, uh, the United States and of course the Soviet Union used development much as a tool in that geopolitical competition, not so much for the welfare of Africa. Human rights concerns were certainly overlooked in those states which were allies of the United States or said that they were. And also for much of that time, Africa as a region was our lowest geopolitical priority out of all the regions. Now, that's not to say it was not important, but it's like a pickup basketball game between Olympic athletes. Somebody gets picked last, even though they may be an Olympic athlete. That was just how it was. And then unfortunately, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Africa became even less important in the United States geopolitical view. It was but basically known, some of you may remember some of those economist covers known as the hopeless continent. It was the continent known for HIV AIDS, for the continent that bad news came from. And then of course the world changed dramatically on September 11th, 2001, where all of a sudden we recognized the strategic importance that Africa had and it has changed again more recently became even more important as we have evolved towards a multipolar world and all of a sudden the United States is once again caught up in geopolitical competition with China and to a lesser extent with uh, Russia. There have also been some other constants throughout our relationship. Uh, there's been continuous tension between what I call short-term needs and longer-term strategic goals. Unfortunately, we always had these consistent long-term goals of a stable, prosperous Africa, which seemed to be pushed out by the crisis of the day. The short-term has always, unfortunately, overcome the long-term. And during my career on the continent of Africa, there have been at least four different, very, very different uh, development theories, but none of them seem to have moved Africa from developing to ever becoming developed. Also, Africa has always been seen up to now as a problem to be solved, never an opportunity. People saw Africa as always consistently costing the US taxpayers money, never as a potential for earning income for US businesses. Now the data related to Africa is pretty well known. It's the fastest growing continent, and I use the term youth tsunami to uh, characterize Africa's population. 2016, 1.3 billion. 2060, estimated to be 2.8 billion. It is the youngest continent. Uh, by 2050, half the population will be under 15 years of age. It is becoming more urban. Uh, recently, there are 50 cities over 1 million population. By 2030, there will be over 100 African cities over 1 million. Also, it's becoming more Islamic. Uh, within 10 years, estimates are that the number of Muslims will equal or overtake the number of Christians on the continent. Also, we know the fastest growing economies, and, and this is a well-worn fact, six out of the seven fastest growing economies in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet at the same time, it needs to increase food production by 70% by 2050. Africa needs its own green revolution. Also, it's a treasure house of energy, commodities, farmland, and those strategic rare earths and metals which are so desperately needed for today's technologies. 
Right now, China has a almost monopoly on some of those rare earths, estimated to have 90% of some of those key ingredients that go into our cell phones or into the batteries which are going to power the all-electric vehicles. Also, undeniable Africa, absolutely vital for U.S. security. Three out of five of the most dangerous terrorist organizations in the world operate in Africa. And last year, over 50% of deaths related to terrorism happened in Africa. The Islamic State and Al-Qaeda-related groups are expanding their areas of operations in Africa. And yet, the number of conflicts and the number of people affected by them continue to decline year after year. So why in the heck am I back here doing Africa when I was so happy at Texas Tech University? Those of you associated with uh, academia know that in many respects it's a uh, life which cannot be rivaled anywhere else. It's all the fault of uh, one of my predecessors, Linda Thomas Greenfield. Uh, I was happy, vice provost at Texas Tech in Lubbock, uh, 2016, and the phone rings and uh, Linda's on the line saying, uh, Tibor, would you mind coming back and taking over the embassy in Abuja for a couple of weeks this summer? We're between ambassadors, Secretary Kerry's coming out, and we desperately need some adult leadership. First, I thought it was a joke. Not every day do you get a call asking to come back to Nigeria, but then I said, you know, how can you say no to Linda Thomas Greenfield? So I said, sure. So I'm back in Nigeria, and second day, I have a meeting with a most imposing um, human being, Governor Shatima of Borno State. Borno State, some of you may know, is the state where Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa is committing its depredations. And we're having a, a conversation about the security situation, but then we start talking about this youth tsunami. And he says, uh, Ambassador, many people know that Nigeria's population is going to grow uh, from 180 million to 360 million by 2050. I said, yeah, I, I've read that. Uh, it's going to become larger than the United States in terms of population. But what most people don't know, he said, is that Almost all of that growth is going to take place right here, this part of Nigeria, the north, the area where you have the lowest levels of economic and employment opportunity, the lowest levels of education, not just for women, but for men, the highest rates of poverty, highest rates of underdevelopment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the governor says that without education, without uh, economic opportunities, without women's rights, uh, radicalism, will go on a rampage, and millions of Nigerians are going to head to Europe as uh, migrants. That was a very depressing conversation. I didn't sleep that night. But then the next day, I had just the opposite experience because I had an opportunity to meet with the returning Mandela Fellows. The Mandela Fellows, part of that wonderful Young Afri African Leaders Initiative. And they had just come back from the United States and they were talking to me about their experiences and, and what they were doing in Nigeria. And it dawned on me as we were having the conversation that never in my life had I met a sharper, more dynamic group of young people anywhere in the world. Not in Africa, not in America, not in Europe, but anywhere in the world. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a difference between potential futures and I also realize that the decisions we make now, not just us in America, but people in Europe, people in Africa, is going to determine which of those two scenarios comes about. And not just for Nigeria, but for, but for Africa in general. Uh, on one hand, youth can bring us dynamism, economic progress, uh, energy, millions and millions and millions of new consumers. Uh, Maybe inventions we can't even dream of. On the other hand, frustrated, angry youth can bring us an incredible increase in radicalism, in migration towards Europe, in instability, in just levels of misery. So there are some givens. Um, youth tsunami will be Africa's defining issue in the coming century. Uh, it's there. It will happen. It can be helped. What can be helped is how it is dealt with. Africa's youth will need jobs, jobs, and jobs. 
Again, that's a given. Uh, Africa's young people today have the uh, access same information that young people have here and in Europe, and they see what young people in other parts of the world have access to. They have the exact same dreams, uh, no different. And then another one is that jobs are created by foreign direct investment. They're not going to be created through government policies or by development assistance. And they're certainly not going to be created by the type of business that China does in Africa. So I also realized that what we needed is a new paradigm. And what I call that, uh, and I should have trademarked this when I first started using it, is that we need to be looking at Africa through the windshield, not the rear view mirror. We need to be looking at the Africa that's ahead, not the Africa that's behind us. Now, I am very happy with the US government's new Africa strategy that was articulated uh, back in December by Ambassador Bolton because it matches very closely with some of the goals that I came back to government with because I believe that it will make a direct and positive impact on the United States, but also most especially on African security and prosperity because I think it's essential for us to get to that scenario too regarding Africa's youth tsunami. So what are the goals of the uh, Africa strategy? They're fairly straightforward. Dramatically increase trade and investment between the United States and Africa. Work with African partners to advance peace and security across the continent. And then reaffirm America's commitment to Africa. And also, in, by the way, counter the Chinese narrative about us through ongoing and new programs. And, and I think it's important to stress through ongoing and new, because wonderfully, Africa is one of the very few bipartisan issues in the United States today. I mean, people can disagree about just about anything vehemently, but when it comes to Africa, uh, when I went through my confirmation hearings, I had uh, sen senators from the far left to the far right all wanting to see me and talk about the same things about how can we help Africa, how can we get, engage with Africa, how can we get Africa to that uh, development level. And some of those programs, AGOA, going back to President Clinton, PEPFAR, President Bush, Power Africa, President Obama, Feed the Future, President Obama, Build Act, President Trump, Prosper Africa, President Trump, Global Women's Empowerment Initiative, President Trump, Young African Leaders Initiative, one of my favorites, President Obama. So uh, we have had recently a number of really great success stories. I, I am just delighted with what's been going on. Uh, Ethiopia and the Greater Horn of Africa. Who would have ever imagined the dramatic changes that have taken place there thanks to a dynamic, courageous leader who's willing to step out and do things that his predecessors have been unwilling to do, both internally in Ethiopia, but more importantly, externally within the whole region. Angola, a president who was expected to just follow the steps of his predecessor, was an extension of his predecessor, again, courageously has been attacking corruption, really opening up to Angola to business beyond uh, what had been going on before. Democratic Republic of the Congo, President Chisikedi was here just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, operating in a very, very constrained constitutional environment, but some of the steps he, have ta he has taken, just remarkable. Just today, he has set up a new institution to directly address the trafficking in persons problem that has been so horrible in the Congo. Nigerian elections, not great, but a step forward. Again, you know, one of those situations where we hope that the next event will be better than the previous event. The event that just took place was about as good as the previous one. Hopefully the next one will be much better, but, but a step forward. And then, my gosh, uh, who would have thought even a week ago uh, what's happening in Sudan would be happening? Um, just we've, our representatives have had discussions with the uh, Transition Military Council, some very encouraging developments today, discussions going on, they may be ready very soon to announce a transition council that 
most people will be very, very happy with. So, you know, who knows, but, but incredible, incredible progress. The biggest problems remaining, and we can talk about some of these individually uh, when we get to our discussion. Of course, the Sahel, the situation there not progressing, going backward, uh, the virus of terrorism increasing, Somalia, that's one of those situations uh, when I left as ambassador to Ethiopia in 2003, uh, there was a terrorist group on the rampage in Somalia called Ali Tiad. I come back uh, 20, you know, about 20 years later and there's a terrorist group on the rampage, Somalia, oh, name has changed, it's Al-Shabaab. South Sudan, um, one of the countries that keeps me awake at night, Cameroon, it would be wonderful if Cameroon could be the next Sudan. My gosh. Zimbabwe, same for that. Um, on my departure from Guinea, the Guinean government was gracious enough to give me a knighthood. And Guinea being a majority Muslim country, they, the ceremony, they did not serve champagne. It was water. And they filled my water glass partially and, and when I left, I, I said, you know, looking at this glass in my, in my remarks, I said, looking at this glass, I was talking about Guinea, but this could apply to Africa. I don't know if the glass is half full or half empty. There are, it, it, it's a real bifurcated situation. There's so many dynamics for saying that it's half full and we're moving forward, but there are all equally others which unfortunately would indicate that it's, it's half empty. Personally, I have always been, and I am now more than ever, an Afro-optimist because I believe we may finally, after so many false starts, be getting to what we can truly characterize as an Africa century. I love African proverbs. Uh, one of my favorites is that even the darkest night is followed by a bright dawn. Even the darkest night is followed by a bright dawn. And Hopefully, we can be the ones now to finally help bring about Africa's sunrise. So thank you very much. Ready to take your questions. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Naj. That was a, a, a great look back. And again, from what, someone who began this in the 70s, I guess, it's a, a, a pretty amazing to look back at that arc of history. Um, I, before we open up to, uh, to questions and answers, maybe just a few from me. Um, Ambassador Bolton's remarks were very much kind of framed in the kind of geopolitical language of geopolitical rivalry and China and Russia and so forth. And what's interesting is that you began your career uh, in Southern Africa in the 1970s when China and the Soviet Union were supporting independence movements. And the US was in some alliances with folks that were not particularly uh, respectful of human rights uh, and democracy, including apartheid South Africa. And, you know, always in every foreign policy, there's the tension between kind of the pragmatic immediate and the ideal and the kind of values agenda. And I think one of the worries that kind of emanated from the framing of that Africa strategy was, it, does this mean a reversion to kind of picking, picking leaders um, and perhaps, uh, you know, in, in that rivalry, in a place like Djibouti, where there's a real strategic interest in that location, for example. And so I just, you know, where is democracy and human rights within this? And how do we do it? Because it's not, it's not the same as, as it has been in the 90s and 80s. It's a different world right now. So how do you do it in a different way? It's a different world. I'll never forget, I went back to Ethiopia in like 2010, met with Prime Minister Mellison. And Prime Minister uh, said to me, you know, Mr. Ambassador, uh, when you were here, we were basically stuck with you. Uh, now we got options. We have other friends <laughs> yeah. who are not quite as strict with us, yeah. i.e., China. But but here's here's a neat thing, because in fact we can we can still do it, and it's under the rubric of that very first goal that I mentioned, uh, increasing trade and investment. Because under that umbrella, it's that's a two-way deal. 
as I have told uh, my meetings with African heads of state, who all said, oh, we want American investors. We desperately want American investors. Because the Chinese bring their own employees, and they don't really create jobs and transfer technology. They build infrastructure and then go home kind of thing. And, and, and they say that. So I said, OK, I, I'm not like President Xi. I can't order uh, Microsoft to go to the Gambia because he has all state-owned enterprises. I can encourage American business to go, and American business, in fact, wants to go. Uh, we have attended a investors' events uh, in New York at the General Assembly session uh, for Angola. I think one was for Rwanda. And you couldn't get in the room. There were so many you know, leaders of American business there. And, and they were very frank. They said, we have billions of dollars to invest because the economy in the United States has been good but we're going to be very selective in where we invest. So, back to Africa. We can look the African leaders in the eye and say, you want American business? Here's what you have to do. By the way, American businesses care about uh, level playing field. They care about uh, how you treat your workers. They care about good governance. They care about uh, contracts. They care about a justice system which is just and the decision doesn't always go to the president's nephew or whoever pays the highest bribe. Uh, care about women's equality. You know, so all of those, what I call the, the soft human rights democracy. They don't like internet shutdowns. Yeah, <laughs> that's another one, yeah. So, so we, can, we can actually put those very neatly under the rubric of attracting more positive US involvement in their country. Uh, what we found out over decades is, as I was saying, uh, you know, President B has been there for 30 whatever years, is you don't get very far wagging a finger in somebody's mm -hmm. face, but you can make it in their interest to do commendable things like that because even the most despicable dictators live in the capital city and driving around most African capital cities these days, you see the thousands and thousands of young people on the streets. And in some of them, they are very angry. I mean, the, you, the anger is, is, is perceptible. And those presidents who look outside their doors see that as well. That's why they come to us and say, please, we need jobs. We need jobs for our young people. Uh, even Pres uh, Prime Minister Mellis well, you know, once told me, well, you know, if these people are angry, they're going to just wash us away, which is true. And, and we have seen the uh, results of true people power in the streets of Khartoum. Mm -hmm. And other people are paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of staying on the governance note, there, or I think that's, you know, making that business case for kind of govern uh, good respect for law, human rights um, is a strong point. You know, we've, you've talked about kind of the rise and the continued spread of extremist mm -hmm. and militant extremism. And the current responses, which tend to lean on the military side of things, are not doing the trick. There's got to be a military component yeah. to a response. Um, but I wonder um, where you see that trajectory going at this point, and what can the US do? I mean, much of this will be up to the partner governments. But where do you th see the US shifting its approach to that? 80% uh, of it is up to the partner governments, because here, here's the deal. Um, the US and allies can be very effective at helping kill the bad guys. But once you kill the bad guys, then what? Uh, for example, in Mali, take, you know, take Mali. Uh, you can get rid of some of the terrorist groups, but if the Malian government then does not move in with government services, with education, with opportunities, with help for farming, <coughs> with real law and order, then all that's going to happen is in a number of years you're going to have another set of bad guys come in that's worse than the last group. Because that's exactly what happened in Somalia. Because you had uh, Ali Tiad, then you had the Islamic courts militias, now you have Al-Shabaab. Each group has been more radical than the last. So, so there has, it has to be an essential partnerhood. For example, in Mali, um, the Malian government, under something called the Algiers Accords, should have by now made certain uh, governance improvements 
to help the situation in northern Mali and to a certain extent central Mali. Unfortunately, the Malian government has been very slow to move. As a result, there has not been an improvement in the situation. As a matter of fact, the situation's gotten worse. Um, you have in Mali, you have the French, who under Operation Barkhane are the, the ones who are taking aggressive action against uh, the radicals. You have the United Nations troops who are basically holding territory, which is a very useful thing to do. You have Malian forces being trained, but what you really need more than anything is the willingness, not, not even much more than the willingness, the proactive enthusiasm of the Malian government to fill the space. So, uh, you know, we have some excellent partners, for example, Niger, who is uh, being embattled on three different sides, but they are doing the absolute best they can. And then we have some partners that uh, certainly lack a certain amount of enthusiasm that they should have for improving their own situation. Because at the end of the day, you know, one of the fundamental truths is that the United States of America cannot care more mm -hmm. about a certain country than the government and people of that own country. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, in that, and in, in, in these governance questions, where do we see U.S. leverage lie at, in, with a Mali, for example? Is, is the African Union, is, is, or do we, where are the pressure points that we can bring to bear? Or do we begin to see a shift of kind of a step back from the military side um, to, in, in to force a change? In very few cases, is the United States on its own. We have a whole series of partners. Uh, you know, for example, in Mali, all of the neighbors are keenly, keenly interested. Uh, there are Europeans, and the Europeans, frankly, their interests are somewhat different than ours, because Mali is not directly threatening the United States of America by having one of the various radical groups coming over here, at least not right now. Uh, the Europeans, frankly, are very, very concerned with migration. Uh, that, that's a, a discussion, debate, that they're having, and different countries look at it differently, but for whatever reasons, they would very much want to you know, avoid as much migration as possible. So they are willing to pay a lot of money in Mali uh, to reduce that. As I said, the neighbors are very keenly interested. That's why they formed the group called the G5, to kind of work together, especially on the borders, to, to stop terrorism. It's going to take a while for them, for them to get up. Uh, there's the African Union which has become much more aggressive, much more activist than they were in my day. I mean, in my day, basically, they were uh, an old, cr old club to uh, you know, secure the roles of dictators. Mm -hmm. Well, that has <laughs> shifted very, very much since then. Mm -hmm. um, so the forces are very positive, but at the end of the day, because we are organized in nation states, the individual nations have to be keenly, keenly interested. And, Again, a lot of this vestige, I, I hate to go into a history lesson, because people will be bored to death. Not me. <laughs> but, at, but at the end of the day, you know, colonialism, pl colonialism played a huge part in this, because the way the borders were made in Mali, you have three very different regions, which if there had been natural state evolution, it probably would have ended up as, as three parts of three different countries. And there's a real question as to just how interested are the Southerners in what's going on in the very far north. And then also in Africa, you have this historical anomaly of across the belt, that belt, you have the farmer versus herder conflict, which takes various different aspects in different countries. Uh, you know, in some places it's Christians against Muslims. In other places it's Muslims against Muslims. Two different ethnic groups, which is the case in Mali. You have the Fulani, who are the herders, and then you have the farmers. And that's happening in central Mali, and now it's being, you know, it's made, being made much worse by the infusion of uh, radical Islamic theology. Mm -hmm. One last question for me before I turn it, because I know there's a lot of very engaged, interested people um, on DRC Congo. Yes. Because yes. <laughs> you probably expected this, but you kind of put it in the success case, and I for, for now, it's guardedly gar <laughs> optimistic. And I, you know, it's it's a tricky one because the the, the process of the election was yeah. so extremely flawed. Um, the 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 current president, in some ways, made a, a deal with the his the former incumbent, um, and the the person who won the vast majority of votes is kind of out of the picture. 
And so we, we had a discussion of this in my class, kind of what are the principles that are underpinning kind of congratulating the winner, but right. damning the process? Actually, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the US uh, policy on this, and I'll tell you why. And, and, and actually, I guess the person who brought this home to me better than anyone else was when I visited uh, the region not too long ago, and I had a long meeting, long meeting with President Museveni. And we were talking about the same issue, and, and he looked at me and said, you know, 80% of the people voted to get rid of President Kabila. And that was the most important thing to happen, is to get rid of President Kabila. Said Museveni. Museveni said that, yeah. yeah. You know, this is a guy who's been you know, serving <laughs> yes. for... Yeah. The irony was lost on him. Okay. So, so here's the thing. For, for me, that is very true. The, the paramount objective was to take one step forward and that was to get Kabila the heck out of there. I did not want this to be a case of the impossible perfect being sacrificed for the good. Now, historians will say that if you look carefully at the 1960 US elections, that the results in, in Illinois and Texas were flawed, and in fact, Nixon should have won. I maintain that the right person was inaugurated, and I thank God that Kennedy became our president. Um, in many respects, I think that the right person is the president of the Congo right now. The steps he has taken initially have been very brave, forward-leaning. I expect positive things to come out of it. And again, you know, I've, I've had a lot of media people say, ah, oh, this, this. Uh. Okay, here's the deal. Media reports on events. They take a still photograph. I'm looking at the evolutionary process. I'm looking at it like 60 years. And the way I look at it, for the first time in Congo's history, the DRC may actually be democratic and a republic. For the first time in its history, one of the richest countries on earth may actually share some of that richness with its own people. So, but, the, but the winner, or the, the president, did not win the vote of the people. Well, some people say neither did Kennedy. Well, <laughs> no, 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 seriously, you know, I mean, I, and, I am and, very and, happy. and I, I get the pragmatic side, but well, then, but then the question is, then what's the signal sent, for example? Well, the signal the, sent was very strong because here's what we did. Um, the voters, millions and millions of, of the Congolese went out in absolute good faith and cast their ballots. The candidates ran in good faith. Manipulation happened by the Electoral Commission. So after the elections, we sanctioned them. We sanctioned them with visas, we sanctioned them with, with economic sanctions. And, th and that's the way to do it. Uh, you know, going forward, we'll see what happens. Uh, there'll be another election soon, and the Congo is moving forward. Now, when I said the impossible perfect, uh, you also have to look at what options did you have. It, Kabila was prepared to jettison the election and stay in power for a couple of more years. If the international community has ra had raised Cain and said, oh, these elections were awful, they're terrible, uh, you're giving the presidency to the person who probably did not win the presidency, Kabila would have said, you know what? I'm shocked, you're right. We're going to annul the elections and we're going to run them again in three or four or five or six years. Then there would have been a bloodbath. Mm. Yeah. There, I mean, there was no scenario there, 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 were, there were basically two scenarios. Kabila stays in power with the door opening to who knows what kind of violence. Or following a transition, like I said, you know, take that step forward and then get ready to take another step forward uh, for the benefit of the Congolese people. Now, interestingly enough, I visited the DRC. I met with opposition. I met with NGOs. By the way, the NGOs were delighted that for the first time in history, a Congolese president actually met with the NGOs and civil society. First time. Th they were happy. The Congolese people were overjoyed. You know, somebody said to me, well, you know, you did this on Venezuela and you did this on the Congo. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> there were not hundreds of thousands of people in the street in the Congo protesting what happened. Mm -hmm. the, the feeling in Kinshasa, very positive. The feeling in Eastern Congo, very positive. The feeling around the region is very positive. Again, to me, the people have to care more mm -hmm. than US-based NGOs. All right. 
Good. That's the last one from me. You'll be relieved to hear. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I promised I would ask that one, though. Let's open up uh, for questions. Now, it's very bright, so I have a hard time seeing you. I see the uh, gentleman waving and then the, man, the gentleman right behind him, and then we'll move over here. I would take one at a time. Uh, wait for the mic and please introduce yourself. Oh, also, let me say, one part questions, please, and only one question. I turned 70 years old this week, so my brain's not what it used to be. <laughs> right, I, thank you so much. Uh, my Happy question birthday. is, like, you, you do get to, to talk to these leaders, and we, we've seen that when they stay in power, they don't end well. But somehow, they stay. I know. It's like a, a, a drug or something. Uh, it's not good for their family. It's not good for anybody who's associated with them. Why do they stay in power? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I, wish, I wish I'd had the nerve to ask President Bia that when I, when I met with him, because you're right. I mean, and, and it is so frustrating to the people, and it becomes more frustrating every year as the population gets younger and younger. When uh, you have leaders that are three or even four times as old as the average population, and you know, the, I, I know the salary of some of these leaders is not that great, but they must have wonderful financial advisors because they tend to amass incredible amounts of wealth. And you would think, how much is enough? But I mean, we, we all know here, African society, uh, what the imperatives are. You know, absolute loyalty to family, loyalty to the, whatever you want to call it, the village, the ethnic group, then, then it keeps getting larger and larger. And many times uh, these leaders are ready to say, you know, I, I want to go retire on the farm. But then the people around them um, tend to say, no, you're not leaving. Because if you leave, we may be charged for corruption. If you leave, uh, uh, you know, the nephew doesn't get the contract anymore. And then in a couple of cases, and I'm not going to mention any names, uh, a very wise leader who started out being very dynamic and very caring of their own people uh, switched after 15, 20 years in power. And, you know, I mean, I, I have to say, uh, President Museveni, when he first came in, was one of my heroes. Uh, he, he, he was the African leader who was more dedicated to confronting the scourge of HIV AIDS than anybody else. Uh, he's been there a long time. Um, yes, I said the gentleman right behind, and then we'll come over here. Yeah. Thank you again for speaking tonight. Excuse me for using my notes. Um, this is kind of a, a straightforward question. Uh, how is Trump's new Africa strategy navigating the lines between encouraging democratic change or supporting political and or supporting political stability, especially as it applies to your, your first point on increasing trade and investment in the continent? Well, like I say, um, economic growth is absolutely essential for Africa. And we are putting into that basket of enticing greater economic involvement with these countries, the necessity for better governance, for treating your people better, for caring about your population, for giving women equal rights, for you know, giving rights to disadvantaged minorities. I mean, all of those things that are important. I want to make that important for them. Because if it's not important for them, you know, we can do a, a parachute in by myself, my boss, the secretary, you know, have an hour of lecturing them, and then leave, and then nothing changes. I, I, I want things to change that are for the better of Africans, for better for their future, for better for their economies. And I will do it whatever, under whatever guise I can do it, but I want to do it. I want to see more Sudans. I want to see more Ethiopias. I want to see more Angolas. Uh, Mima and then Max in the front row. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary Naja. Uh, I'm nearing 67, so I'll try to keep my straight, my thoughts straight, <laughs> <laughs> and keep the question short. 
But as you know, uh, and I'm very, very pleased to be, I'm also on the board of the, uh, the David H. Miller Foundation, who was actually the beginning of uh, Africa Global Schaefer Group that I'm CEO of now. You know Schaefer is having built Fincher Sugar in Ethiopia, and you're ambassador there. And I, I want to go back to, and I have also colleagues with West Africa LNG, because we're now operating in Guinea with the US LNG coming in. The real key, if we can come back to, is this new Prosperity Africa initiative. Because in the end, as you say, you know, it's a little bit like old era freaks used, used to say, chaque jour and premier, every day a little bit better. Yeah. Yes, the political environment is getting better, but the business environment yeah. is getting an awful lot better. Yes. And I want to come back to the business environment yeah. because that really is, in the end, where the key is. Not in every country, but certainly more and more of them. And that, in the end, is, you know, where people are going to speak is where they put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where U.S. business is coming in. And that's why, you know, I'd like to hear a little more of that kind of two-way street. Prosperity only works when both sides prosper. And where do we go with it? Because that really is something very, very unique within the U.S. Build Act. Thank you. One of the things we have done and are doing is to make each of our embassies proactive in support of U.S. business. Um, we have instructed them to put together what we call deal teams to serve in both directions, to look for opportunities for U.S. business in the country, to let us know what those are so that we can broadcast it to the interested U.S. business community. On the other side, if U.S. business comes there, they better do backward flips in support of that U.S. business. Uh, when I first got into the diplomacy game, U.S. ambassadors were above, you know, help being tradesmen <laughs> of, of, of pushing U.S. products. That was not there. You know, right. they were brilliant political analysts. Selling Boeing airplanes, that was, that was Boeing's deal. That has changed 180 degrees. My ambassadors better be absolutely proactive in supporting U.S. business. Then also, what you talked about the business climate. One of the things I've done whenever I visit a country is I sit down with the American business community and get the lowdown on what really is hurting them. I mean, we, we know the standbys about, you know, the corruption generically or unfairness of the judicial system, uh, unfairness of land tenure because you build your factory and the third cousin of the third cousin shows up with a piece of paper showing, yeah, that it's, that it's his. So I want to get into specifics so that the embassy can then sit down with the government and say, specifically, these are the things you need to change. For example, in both Congo and Cameroon, huge problem with taxation. Congo, there are 82 different taxes, and the International Monetary Front, Front, Fund has told both countries to increase tax revenues, but they're not increasing the tax revenue by broadening the tax base. They're increasing it by squeezing the people who already pay taxes even more. Uh, and they're going to approach a point where people are going to say, the heck with this, I'm out of here. Every day a different tax person comes and harasses them because their annual bonus is based on the amount of tax owed uh, that they estimate, not what is actually received. You know, so, so these are the, the very specific things that, that we're finding. And I want our embassies to be proactive and address them. You know, I, because again, this is to the benefit of US companies, it's to the benefit of African countries, and it's benefit of African people. We are very supportive of the African Union's continent-wide free trade agreement, uh, because hopefully that will bring some uniformity. But at the same time, I want to have a bilateral free trade agreement with an African country, sub-Saharan. Up to now, the United States of America only has one free trade agreement with an African country, that's Morocco. Okay, Morocco's, you know, it's part of the African Union and everything, but I, I want one with a sub-Saharan African country. Let, no, it's about 1.3% of U.S. foreign direct investment today goes to Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, that's a travesty. The richest continent on earth with incredible wealth and resources and and young people who could be phenomenal consumers and customers. And by the way, Africans love America. You know, they might not like one administration or another, but they love the concept of America. They would prefer to do business with us, but for the last several decades, uh, when there's been a knock on the door, on the investor's door, 
and the African uh, you know, government opens it, the only person standing there is a Chinese. I don't blame them for doing business with the Chinese. You know, so, no, I'm, I'm very, very focused on this because I think that this is a true win, 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 win. And, and I want those young Africans to have jobs. As, just to follow on, on Prosper Africa, is, uh, is there uh, kind of a skills element to, let, to let it as well? Let me tell you about Prosper Yeah, Africa. maybe if you could okay. elaborate a bit on that. And I'll start with this. For decades, we, the United States of America, have told African governments and African countries that if you want to have business investment, if you want to improve your business climate, then set up a one-stop shop. And a lot of them have done that. Never in our history has the United States of America had a one-stop shop for American businesses wanting to do investment and trade in Africa. Now, the global companies can do business anywhere, you know, from Ant Antarctica to Zimbabwe. But the medium and the small size businesses cannot, and they are Africa-averse. Because when they hear the word Africa, they think, you know, corruption, this, that, that, and the other. So we want to mobilize the U.S. government's resources, what I say is under one umbrella, so that we can make it easier for businesses, U.S. businesses, to, who are interested in Africa to go there. That's why the BUILD Act, you know, increasing OPIC, it's not going to be OPIC, it's going to be the, uh, what is it, the International Development Finance Corporation, or I always forget the, the name, $60 billion. Now you're talking real money. They're going to be able to do equity deals. African governments have been victimized. I don't mean to pick on China, but they've been victimized by uh, investment that has come in the form of debt. So you had the debt trap you know, through the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they were able to write it off in the 90s. Now there's a danger of Africa being indebted again under those guises. Very few African governments are used to doing equity deals. We have an American company that beat out the Chinese for a $3 billion project in Uganda, and they did it as an equity deal, and they almost didn't get it because the Ugandans had real problems accepting the fact of how an equity deal works because these countries are very comfortable pulling out the loan application, filling it in. I owe China $6 billion here. Well, I don't know it. My grandkids will own it. So, so American companies, I think, offer tremendous benefit. We care about the environment. You know, we transfer technology. We play by the rules. We actually employ Africans to do the job instead of bringing everybody above the level of turning a shovel from the home country. And, and, and this is getting around. People understand. But if American companies don't go there, then the contract's going to go still to the Chinese. Because I can't order you guys to go. I wish I could, but I can't. My name is Max Bone, and I'm a student studying international affairs. Um, multiple times today you have mentioned Cameroon. I spent the summer of 2018 in the heart of the Anglophone regions in Buya, and I watched as it went from gunshots once to gunshots daily. Mm -hmm. You have said that y you hope that Cameroon is the next Sudan. While the government certainly is an issue, there are also yeah. militant groups that yeah. are funded in large part by the diaspora. Yeah. These militant groups are advocating for more death. They are transferring funds to groups that are actively killing and kidnapping civilians. While the government is also committing grave human rights abuses, and it is the response of the BIA government that allowed for the situation to get to the point where it is today. I'm curious what message you would like to send to the diaspora here that is advocating for independence by violent means and to the BIA government. Thank you. Yeah, well, I had extensive discussions with the BIA government when I was there a couple of weeks ago. I also did a number of newspaper interviews, and I'll tell you guys the same thing I, I have said publicly before. Cameroon grieves my heart more than almost any other, maybe South Sudan is there too, but, but Cameroon really grieves my heart because it is absolutely needless. The Cameroonian government has it in, in its hands the instrument to start addressing the grievances that the Southwest and Northwest populations have, i.e. central control, uh, directed government, not being able to control their own lives. The 1997 Constitution provides for a 
great deal of decentralization. Unfortunately, the decentralization component of that constitution has never been implemented. The Cameroonian government risks doing in the Northwest and the Southwest exactly what the Nigerian government did in the Northeast with Boko Haram, which started out as a basically harmless organization and through ineptitude, overreaction, violence, turned them into an unfortunately a lethal, now it's two lethal terrorist organizations that have killed thousands and displaced millions. The situation in the Northwest and Southwest of Cameroon is not going to get better until the government realizes that it has to have a genuine dialogue with representatives of the population. It does not mean setting up uh, Potemkin organizations that sound good in name but don't do anything. And it does not mean trying to win militarily because the greatest power on earth learned that we cannot win militarily against an ideology that people are committed to. Look at Vietnam. People, unfortunately, in the Cameroon government, and I suspect that some of the people who are advising President Beer are telling him that if you use the iron fist, you're going to win military. No, they are not going to win militarily. The secessionists are going to become more violent in reaction to every violence on the part of the government authorities. And as Gandhi so brilliantly said, when you have an eye for an eye, sooner or later the whole world is blind. And that's what's going to happen there. I have told the Cameroonian government that if they have information of illegal activities on the part of anyone in the United States to let us know, you know, we will certainly look into that. But the key is dialogue, dialogue today, or else the violence is going to get worse. It's, you know, I, as, as I, I, I told everybody, I said, okay, Every day I get X number of emails with horrendous pictures attached to it of, of people that have been burned, abused, buildings burned, people chopped up. And then every time I meet with the Cameroonian government, they hand me a book that has pictures that are just as gruesome of gendarmes and soldiers and police, teachers, doctors, you know, with their arms chopped off or their heads chopped off. It's madness. It is absolute madness and it has to end. Hello, uh, my name is Jen Ross. I'm a former student and current development practitioner. Uh, we've heard a lot in the last few months from the administration on the journey to self-reliance. Um, a lot of narrative over that, but not so much as far as implementation and how we get to that goal. If you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on that, that'd be great. Sure. You know, when USAID was set up, it was meant to be a temporary agency. Uh, and yet, people join it today, you know, with the hopes of having a 40 or 50 year career there. Uh, ideally, at some point, the lights are turned out because there's no need for it. That's when I talked earlier when I gave my remarks that during my uh, career, we went through, I can remember at least four very, very distinct development theories of how to uh, help a country develop. And yet, you know, who has developed through development assistance? You know, we can have an academic discussion about that, but I maintain, if anybody has, it has not been that many people. For example, uh, China's incredible development happened without a development agency, you know, or official development money going to China. It was all, it was all foreign direct investment. So the journey to self-reliance, it's country specific, and it's based on what does country X need to get to middle income status, because they're all different. You know, all, all the countries have different needs, different requirements, there are different levels. Some governments are very much interested in bettering the lives of their own people. Some governments are very interested in bettering the uh, Swiss bank accounts of their leaders. And you don't deal the same way with both countries. Because if, uh, you know, you're gonna, if your development assistance is going to go into the pockets of the head of state, then uh, you know, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results kind of thing. And then you stop doing it. So, so that's what the journey to self-reliance is. It's a beginning right now, but the good thing is that it has a, an end. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, right now, the United States of America funds all of Uganda's health sector. 
We give 600, you guys give, not we, because the government is you. You give $660 million a year to Uganda for their health sector. And the Ugandans say, well, you know, this, this, this is great. Because the United States, you're taking care of our health sector, and the Chinese are taking care of our infrastructure. Except they're paying the Chinese to take care of their infrastructure, but they're getting $660 million from us every year. And they will be absolutely delighted to take the $660 million from now until infinity. There's something wrong with that picture. You know, at some point you have to say to somebody, you know, Start planning for your own health system. Let's, let's reduce it this year. Let's reduce it a little more next year. Let's reduce it a little more next year. Because it should not be the United States of America taxpayers funding the Ugandan health system while the Ugandans are paying the Chinese to build their roads, their airports, their oil refineries, and other things. So that's, that's kind of it. That, that's been one of my real uh, passions since, since I landed on the continent. Uh, Mel Foot, Constituency for Africa. Nice to see you, Ambassador. Um, my question has to do with the fact that President Trump has been reluctant to deal with issues of climate change. And we're looking at millions of uh, good people in Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Malawi and understand Tanzania is about to get hit today. Uh, what is the U.S. response to the, the cyclone and other uh, growing uh, climate-related issues on the continent of Africa? When disasters happen, the United States is there first and foremost. Uh, I am very proud of what, uh, how many different government agencies have responded to the Mozambican cyclone. Uh, we will do it again. I will, when I was talking about development assistance, I want to very carefully distinguish between humanitarian assistance, which responds to emergencies which are no fault of anybody's, and development assistance, because for humanitarian assistance, the United States is the world leader. Uh, you know, ask the Chinese what they've done for the cyclone. We've had Department of Defense, Department of State, USAID, Food for Peace, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and on and on and on. And whenever anything like that happens, we're going to be there. On climate change, administrations have their policies on climate change. I'm not in the policy making business. Hi, thank you so much, Mark Brown with the David Miller Foundation and, and alumnus here. David Miller uh, of blessed memory started the Corporate Council in Africa in, I believe, 1993 with uh, Ambassador David Miller and some other folks, uh, some big companies, and they kind of, he, his goal was to do exactly what you were saying, uh, kind of a consortium, one one stop shop for uh, middle market companies that aren't a billion dollars that can't just set up shop. And they were on that road and uh, it sounds great. But I wanted to offer kind of a shout out to our new board member who wasn't able to make it here because uh, she's a recent uh, young graduate of uh, Vanderbilt, but she was 52nd person hired uh, by Uber and she oversees uh, continent and I'm wondering if you could pass the message on to her so she'll watch this tape you could tell uh, you could mention uh, you know some of the uh, the Trump administration support which we all support as your as uh, our president love how you've also commented on some of the other administrations and we understand how tough it is to to navigate over there um, as we've all been connected to David since he was uh, trying to promote business in Angola back during a very tumultuous time in the mid 80s. That's how we got started in this whole uh, uh, very, very challenging effort. Thanks. Yeah, yeah bravo uh, absolutely to what the Corporate Council for Africa envisioned when you guys started because it was not easy. It was not an easy sell then because that was uh, pre 9-11. I think that was, may have been the very low point of Africa's prominence as far as U.S. policy was concerned. And the thought of investing in Africa was so far out, you know, that very few people had that, that vision. It's amazing how much the mindset has, has changed now. Like I said, my heart leapt for joy when I went to those investment forums in New York and I couldn't even get in because there was so much interest you know, in, in going to Africa. And that's just, I, I think that's just going to go up and up and up as American business realizes that these millions and millions and millions and millions of young Africans represent uh, potential consumers. And uh, 
and, and we will be there. And Africa will take its rightful place of prominence that unfortunately up to now it hasn't taken. Ambassador, Ambassador Liberta Mlamula, retired and then I was in, unretired by Ambassador Ruben here with the Elliott School. And you have Jennifer Cook, who is my boss now. Oh, so, not really. <laughs> Ambassador, I know there's no, time is not in our favor, but just briefly, if you could tell us about the South Sudan, how do you bring uh, Ricky Michelle <laughs> to back to Juba? And they were, imagine, at Vatican, and I was happy to see the Pope kneeling down, literally on their feet, that you guys, it's time to make peace. Thank you. You know, I, 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 you've, you've picked the two countries in, in these, the discussion that grieve my heart more than anything else. Uh, because we talked about Cameroon and the needlessness of the violence there. Um, South Sudan is, is similar in that the violence has been entirely, entirely needless. That people who fought to make the country independent, you know, it's historically, it is very difficult for a, a rebel movement that actually achieves independence to then move in and become an effective government. It's been done very, very rarely. And, and for what happened there is, is beyond <laughs> inexcusable. What, uh, there's a deadline coming up, you know, by which time they're supposed to start the transition. And I fear that no one expects that that deadline will be met. There, of course, is the problem of uh, Cirillo. Um, and the Ethiopians, I think, are becoming more supportive and playing a very positive role in that. The Sudanese were actually playing a positive role. Now we'll see what happens with the transition in Sudan. The Ugandans have an opportunity now to play a positive role. Um, what we have to, I think, be assured of and to press on more than anything else is to under no circumstances allow the fighting to start up again. If there's going to be a delay in implementation, you know, that's, that's open to, to discussion. But the absolute worst thing that could happen would be for the fighting to start up, for the violence to start up, for those horrendous rapes to start up again. So the, uh, the international community has to be very united in sending that message and, uh, you know, using whatever tools are available. Because we also know that a lot of these people have their wealth outside of the country. I mean, it, it, it's funny, if you go to Nairobi, almost any taxi driver will go down the street and say, this mansion belongs to this warlord, this mansion belongs to that warlord. So I, I think the international community has some tools, but under no circumstances can we allow the fighting to start up again. Thank you very much for that question. I want to say a big thank you to you for taking the time, taking the range of questions. I imagine the challenge for the policymaker is to keep your eye on that big strategic vision and then deal with the day-to-day -day crises, the opportunities that come up in a place like Sudan and the crises that worsen in, in Cameroon and South Sudan, all while you're trying to kind of manage that much bigger vision. Um, you've done a masterful job today of uh, keeping, you know, Getting, being real about the challenges, but also, I think, energizing us on kind of the upside. Um, the message to the embassies in terms of, you know, it's a new day. Um, it's, uh, you, it's, it's a new, new tasks in terms of looking for the commercial and kind of helping sell the United States to a certain extent. I think that's really important. Um, I want to thank you um, both for the job you do at the State Department, but also mostly for coming to talk with us tonight. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, thank you.